All right, Johanny, uh, do you want to tell me a bit about yourself, uh, a bit about Tacombe and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure thing, Alex. I actually fell into HR by accident. I think that's uh, most people's <laughs> story. I, I was going to, I knew for sure I was going to be an English professor and I was uh, in college and I, I started working for a staffing agency, Manpower. and my manager took a liking to me and taught me really everything that she knew and i i fell in love with connecting the right person to the right organization and i did i ended up getting an english degree and all of that but i um i just ended up in hr and i've been here ever since so i've been with tacombe almost three years i've done HR for about 17, not to give away my age, <laughs> but I <laughs> love it. I absolutely love um, the brand and, and the people that I work with. I'm inspired by them uh, on a daily basis. We, we're we growing very, very fast. If you don't know Tacombi, we're a Mexican uh, restaurant. We have about we have 20 locations, 11 in New York City, where we wow. um, opened our first location. And now we are in the D.C. market, Florida, Miami market. Uh, we opened in Chicago, Long Island, Connecticut, and we're going to take over the world. <laughs> it's amazing. And you know, it's amazing because when we were chatting beforehand, I was telling you that like, my in my household we love we love the corn so much and if anybody's listening order the corn and my missus just texted me she said tell them i'm their biggest corn order <laughs> like while we're preparing for this and that's really funny i love it i think it's fantastic what you guys are doing thank you so much and like i guess like you know like kind of stepping out of that you know like you're growing so quickly you know what i mean like which presents probably enormous opportunities obviously for you but like enormous challenges like for you in your role what do you think are the three kind of biggest challenges for you as you grow so rapidly yeah that's a great question i would say this summer we opened five locations and it, it <laughs> i have the gray hairs to prove it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it you know being being a, a in our infancy really still um the the challenge uh for for me and my team i would say was acquiring you know great people um having back-to-back -back locations open in different states and really prioritizing and um that to me that was the the most challenging thing for this summer with acquiring um i i think it was something like we needed to to hire 50 plus managers and managers four, yeah and 400 plus uh hourly team members so it was uh quite challenging um but we we have a really great team yeah um, so that's a that's one of the the challenges right now you know it's interesting you say 50 general managers in particular because or 50 managers rather but like because one of the things I hear from everyone, like uh, like all your peers, and again, this is like a, you're like, oh, thank God, it's not just me. But it's like finding managers mm -hmm. that like can slot in, can live your brand, can accept like the way you guys want to run business as opposed to the way they want to run your business is something that is increasingly more difficult to kind of come across in particular, like in the sort of post COVID era that there seems to be like a general sort of dearth of like quality GMs at a volume that you can really kind of step up and run new operations. So I'm curious then to counteract that, are you, how do you look at the existing staff that you have today? And uh, do you have like programs for like growth or management or any of these kinds of things to help homegrown talent? I sound like a football coach or something, but like, you know, like homegrown, <laughs> homegrown talent, so to speak. <laughs> um, I I love that you brought that up because I do see that being such a challenge for for this industry in particular. But something that we did about a year and a half ago at the Combi, and and it's been 
incredibly successful, we shifted from just a general manager, typical general manager uh, role, and we converted them into managing partners. And mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so what that means, we wanted our, our managers are the stability of our right? They, they are the empowered leaders that are constantly, you know, coaching, developing, training the team, motivating the team. So we wanted um, our managers to feel more ownership of the yeah. And, you know, their, their compensation should reflect that. If they're doing an amazing job, if they're managing labor cogs, et cetera, and, you know, developing team members, um they they also they get profit sharing um yeah. so that's that's something that that we change uh in our model and it's been really successful we converted the general managers at the time put them through a a managing partner training program yeah and um which included a lot of back of house fundamentals because sometimes what I see is a, a divide, right? There's yeah. back of house, there's front of house. Um, what better way to empower our managers than than for them to really truly understand, you know, what portioning, what safety, what you know, like really get a deep understanding of of kitchen operations. So they, you know, it really gives them a 360 view of of the taqueria of the restaurant. Totally. And when you judge that as a success from your perspective, is that like a churn metric or is that like an acquisition? What kind of metric do you look at there to like measure that success? Really good question, Alex. I, I would say both. <laughs> I would say um, one thing that we did um, in converting is is notice they're, they're not the general managers that didn't have the, the training prior. Yeah. They just became so much more well versed in the numbers and PLs and understanding the business holistically. And then also from a from a structured hiring perspective, Love Greenhouse, we implemented them as our applicant tracking system. And we use scorecards um, to, you know, check our bias and make sure yeah. that we're focused, laser focused on hiring people that have that are empowered leader, scrappy entrepreneur and a brand ambassador. Those are the three things. Yeah. Buckets that we uh you know look for. But it's it's been great retention wise. It's been great um from a profitability perspective for our managers. Yeah. And career pathing being that we we really believe in cross training. Um, our back of house managers that never really had the opportunity to to become a GM, let's say. Yeah. Now that that that's possible because our back of house team members also train in administrative duties, scheduling, hiring, all of the above. So it's been it's been um, a lot of foundational work, but it's paying off for sure. Yeah, that's awesome, and like. It's interesting you had the three phrases, what do you call them? Brand ambassador. Um, scrappy entrepreneur. Scrappy entrepreneur. And the third one was? Empowered leader. Empowered leader. Okay, so those three buckets. Okay, so you obviously interview those as like a heuristic to look at. How do you, because I'll tell you, I'll tell you where my brain is going with this now. One of the things I hear time and again is you can teach service to people. You can teach things. You get a general manager who doesn't know how to look at a PL, you can pay for accounting classes and you can get them to where that person needs to go or get them to go where they need to go but hospitality as a sort of genetic dna disposition is and great hospitality is like hard to describe but you know when you see it you know and like it's almost like a lot of people will describe it in so many different ways like a uh, like the french would call it a je ne sais quoi you know it's like and i wonder because you seem to have hit upon something there where like spirited entrepreneur uh brand ambassador I keep, i'm gonna get these wrong all the time brand ambassador spirit entrepreneur and uh empowered leader empowered leader okay so those two things when you're like interviewing or when your gms are interviewing staff like to come in it are they like prepared to like figure out like what those are so like, you guys have a great read on what those key things are because you think that they're the great makeup for your business 
Yes, exactly right. So we, so there, there are uh, different steps in the interview process to assess those characteristics of somebody that would be a, a scrappy entrepreneur. So there's a set of questions that, and we fine tuned it. There's been a, a 2.0, 3.0, like we, we, you know, along the way to, to make sure that we were maximizing each step, but essentially, um, uh, some of it is behavioral based questions, right? Some of it is um, a written assessment that yeah. just just what would you do? The lights are out, you know, the, the story, yeah. you know, what, what would you do just to understand somebody's thought process? Yeah, and I like that. On the hospitality part, um, I have my senior director of hospitality do that interview step. And they get to role play, and it's yeah. it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, uh, Luis Berenbao is his name. So Luis will ask the um, the candidate, "Hey, this is the scenario," and action, and they'll act it out, and and it it, it just gives us a little glimpse of yeah. how somebody would you know coach a team member or handle a a, a guest, you know, an, an upside guest, and turn that that person around. That's awesome because I love how you've sort of formalized a framework mm -hmm. for these sort of intangible sort of qualities that you need in staff in hospitality. You know, like I think uh, a lot of people describe it, you know what I mean? And it's everyone's got their different version of it. And I really think it's cool that you've like formalized that as like, no, we're all on the same page here. These are the things because, you know, the alternative is like, you know, digging for diamonds, you know what I mean, in the rough. And like that in and of itself is just like very difficult, especially as you're scaling so quickly. So it's very cool that you formalize this process as you scale all these locations. And it seems to be paying off for you. I mean, it's and you seem so bullish about it. So like more power to you, you know? Well, it's it's I, I think that that uh it's a work in progress for sure. Yeah. But we we have retained our managers they're they're happy they feel they you know drink the kool-aid and they feel uh like they, as we grow they want to grow with us and and we're invested in on our team in in the managers and and um we're ironing now what career pathing looks like for everyone and so it's a work in progress but thank you for saying so um yeah no of course and i think like you know it's it, because it's a work in progress i think it's like the whole industry is in a work in progress to trying to iron this out as well i think like you know and it's amazing for the employees i think like i it's like when i think about like uh you know alternative like the previous histories of like working in kitchens for example you know they seem to have been very stressful sort of anthony bourdain or even more modern like tv shows like the bear give an impression that it's like some crazy sort of like environment to be in and i mean those environments do exist but i don't think that they're the kinds of environments that like can help businesses thrive grow and move into scale if that makes sense and so it's amazing to hear all these programs that like quite clearly separate good from great in terms of like growth companies like when i have people on this podcast people talk about training all the time as an absolute imperative for their staff because it is now a key benefit for keeping staff in the first instance you know and like when i think about that then you know like you're hiring across a whole range of different type of people now as well you know different backgrounds you know, different ages in particular everyone always wants to talk about like say gen z and the difference of having them in the workplace versus say like you know your boomers in the kitchen or you know whatever else you know and i'm curious your take on like bringing in this new influx of sort of younger workers that are post-covid that are more incredibly digitally native versus like say everybody else is there like uh, uh, do you guys give special tall treatment to like how you bring in gen z into the workplace that that's very interesting it, it is true we have four generations and it's but i the, the part of structured hiring that I love the most it is that it really allows us to check our bias, right? Because for me, uh, I, I mean, I, 
just transparently speaking, people say, oh, this generation is lazy or this generation yeah. is better. Or, you know, I, I really don't, I don't feed into that if, yeah. if you will, because I'm laser focused on, um, these are the things and these are the questions and, and we we're consistent across the board. And even afterwards, we do a roundup where we have a few candidates in the process and I partner with either operations or whoever, and we discuss, you know, what, what are the strengths and, and I don't think that ever comes up that it's a uh, old, young, older, you know, I don't, I, I really don't think that we look at it that way. Um, it, it's about culture fit. It's about, you know, the, the, uh, the hunger, the drive, the ability and the desire. Um, so I, I don't know if that was, uh, <laughs> It, no, it's true. I mean, it, it, it's interesting, I think, you know, in the sense that, like, again, everyone has an opinion on it, you know, and different companies have different opinions on it. So I'm always curious to hear people's kind of take on it because, like, you know, most, like, lots of, you know, hourly workers are, like, well, kind of, if you're younger, because it's, like, a lot of first-time jobs, you know, it's a lot of people in college or, like, you know, like, in finding their feet in life, so to speak, you know. And so it's interesting, I always think, you know, like as a kind of probing question, so to speak. To see yeah, like, no, I, I, we, we do actually have uh, internship programs, summer youth employment uh, interns that we partner with. And I think it's phenomenal. I, I've done uh, uh, some re like resume and interview coaching um, for generation coming into the workforce. And yep. I personally think that I've been very impressed. And um, the the every summer where we do summer youth employment program, and we we have about forty interns uh, in our kitchens and um, in you know all around our dining room, um, learning the host and packing and learning how to be a taquero or or prep. Yep. Um, it, they're just eager to learn, and a lot of them. Um, I'd say, um, from every wave that we've done, we have a hand, uh, full of, of, of uh, interns that do join us and stay, yeah. stay on and, you know, grow with us. So I, I don't, I don't have a, a negative, I, I don't, I don't view it that way. I think, I think that you provide the right environment, the right training, yep. and and you know people can definitely take off and fly. Okay, so you're providing the training, you're providing the right environment. What kind of trends, like workplace trends, are you seeing change? And it might not necessarily be like Gen Z specific, but I guess like you know over the last three years, say you've been at Tacoma or almost three years, um, where it's changed. Hospitality has gone through its sort of revolution not evolution and so i wonder from your perspective like what sort of thing like trends have kind of appeared that you're like oh that wasn't kind of like the case in 2019 for example like are you seeing things that you guys are applying like technology or like process wise or you have that old jazz yeah so i mean overseeing the people team i'm all about people, 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 and what we can do. I, I think people care more about quality of life. And um, I think post COVID, um, a lot more like in the, in the corporate office, a lot more remote or in the, um, in the, for, from an hourly team member perspective, PTO, yeah. that's something that we just implemented last year. Um, so for hourly for the hourly stuff yes oh wow that's quite a benefit for everyone um even uh part-timers now get to have benefits so things like that people are caring more about yep. quality of life and where whereas when i i feel like when i was uh entering the workforce i didn't care about benefits or 401k or you know having any of that and i think people are really like paying attention to the perks and the benefits and what, you know, what, um, just different. I, I just think that they're going in more informed now than when yeah. I was. Then we, then we went in. Yeah. 
Oh. Like you mentioned pet insurance and you pet, like all, all of these things people care about so much more than when I was joining the, the workforce, I'd say. I, 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 w- I would agree with you on that. I think that's definitely something that I hear is that like, you know, I guess the, con- the consciousness of choice exists in the employee now in a way that it didn't before. And I guess that's caught up with the re- with other industries. Like if you talk to people in tech like 10 years ago, like they'd be like, oh, Facebook to Dropbox to whatever kind of company, you know what I mean? Which has the best benefits, you know what I mean? Like, which has like, you know, and not just from an economical like salary perspective. It's like, you know, that quality of life question was like answered then. And it sounds like for the, in that industry, but I'm saying in parlaying that into like restaurants, it's like or in hospitality, it's like catching up with that now. And like it took a pandemic to do it, which you know, like well, like yeah, that happened. But like it, it took it, but it did it, and it took the industry not kicking and screaming. Like I feel like everyone's like, you know what? Like I feel like the best kind of businesses in this space are like, yeah, actually, we were kind of on the road to doing that anyway, and now we're here, and it's a function of the market. Like ultimately, there's an insane battle for talent. And I saw recently jobs report in hospitality that were only just past what we were in February 2020 in terms of full like employment numbers in the space. And that was growing at the time. So there's still so much more to grow in the industry, which puts an extra onus and burden on say you, which is like to hire more and more people and stay in that battle for talent, which to me means, you know, almost a laser focus on the retention side of things, because ultimately you have to design these programs. So like you're probably gonna go away now after this and Google pet insurance. <laughs> we, have, we have this to our stuff of benefits, you know. Like no. it's a it's a it's a battle, you know. It, it, and you know what's so funny? You mentioned that earlier. Uh, I did a, a a survey, a company wide survey. Hey, like what's important? And that came up a, a bunch. So yeah, I yeah. think it's um the guy who I had on uh, was one of the founders of Chupalo Honey in north carolina and uh it's like a i actually would butcher how i'd even describe it i thought it was amazing there was a line for an hour and a half to go when i went so like that gives you content so like what it was but it wasn't really a line it was more like that was the way for brunch also great spot i mean it was really nice and they've like i think 13 plus locations or something in that oh, wow. world. and uh he was like saying to me he was like you know like and he was a chef himself like cia trained chef and like, he's now like the founder of this and he was saying he was like you know, at the end of the day, like as in a lot of people in hospitality, you know, like they were frontline workers, like mm-hmm. at the front, like when everyone else was working from home with a laptop, like those people were in the kitchens. Those people were like learning how to do Uber Eats at the time. And he was saying anecdotally, like for him, that so many of the staff and people he worked with were like, you know, got pets. You know what I mean? Like they had those, like that obviously people need, like if you think of like the rest of the world was like stunned by COVID, you know what I mean? And kind of traumatized, like can you imagine being front line where you were like, you were still working like in that sort of environment. So I could imagine that lots of people within hospitality got themselves like pets for comfort, you know what I mean? And now it's become a thing where it's like, you know, yeah, like as in a lot of people, it's just fascinating that you did that as well. And you see that as well. I wonder what they kind of make up as a why but like here we are now as a thing and it's like you're you're the second person now that's kind of looking into this which i think is kind of rather oh, fascinating yeah. you know well, it was it was quite up there on um, things that that um people wanted but i think uh, uh employee discount like while coming to the restaurant while not working i think that one beaded um so it's 50% company wide regardless of um, so I think that one beat it and, but we're, we're a- actively looking into it because yeah. I don't have, I don't have pets, but I, I, oh, I um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, there, I, uh, I might turn the corner very soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I, uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell you where to get one if you need one. Oh yeah. Please, please. Rescue is, uh, mine's a rescue. Um, uh, or I should That's say ours is a rescue. Um, yeah. but I think it was a shout out to the missus. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I think like, you know, the consciousness of like the benefits though, the consciousness of like, you know, that like employees are worth more. I think COVID as an experience for the hospitality industry showed the people who work in it, that they're way more valuable 
then I think the entire industry was kind of taking that for granted slightly, you know, and I think that has empowered them to kind of be a bit more forthright about like working conditions, flexible work schedules. Like you'd be surprised like how many like inflexible work schedules are still here. Like people like are still talking about more and more flexible work schedules as a thing. Whereas like you think like post COVID that would be, that's what we sorted like immediately. You know what I mean? Like as in to be able to help people with this quality of life question. And uh, I think, you know, it's great to see, it's great to hear that you're able to like grow so quickly and provide these kinds of benefits you know what i mean because it's all like i don't want to say competing priorities but it's also like you know um there's so many initiatives going on to try and grow the business as fast as possible because you're presumably also responsible for like the i was going to say nso like the new store openings you know in terms of like hiring that like we said like about 50 managers and what's the, the other number that you'd mentioned earlier in the call so like you have an enormous hiring challenge ahead of you as well which is going to be a huge priority for you as well let alone the retention side of things, which is like designing the program to help people grow and evolve. So very busy, Johnny, very, very busy. <laughs> One thing that I'll say uh, that I absolutely love that we did because we're based out of New York. And uh, for example, there's some states where we operate in that that don't have sick time, you know, available. We, we observe it company-wide, regardless, we honor New York 56 hours. Where we're in different states where we operate, there's none. Or, for example, um, paid maternity leave and things like that. Yeah. We, you know, we honor PFL. We honor, um, and I think that it, it it makes a statement. And when when I go to conduct orientation and I'm, you know, getting all the all the new team members excited about hey, these are benefits presentation. People like want to fall off their chair. They're just like, I cannot believe I have PTO or, you know, I have, I can take time off if I, you know, have a child or, yeah. So I, it, it's such a pleasure to see that. And, and, and I, and we hope to do that everywhere where we, we continue to, to grow and expand as we scale. Um, and then the other side of it is we also have a, a huge tortilla factory for our Vista Hermosa. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't Hillside. realize that you guys had a factory as well. Yes. So managing that and ensuring um, that, you know, fa it's 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 a factory in Sunset Park, um, yep. Brooklyn. And, um, you know, just, just making sure that we're equitable and um, where some some benefits wouldn't necessarily um, fall into, into the factory. We still honor things like that. So we just want to, I guess, uh, earn the side of generosity across the board. That's awesome. And I guess there's one final question then, for, because that's a really nice kind of like, I don't want to say it's like sentimental, but it sounds like really, it just sounds like a lovely place to work. Um, but if you were to give one bit of advice to somebody listening this far into the podcast. So if somebody listens this far, that means they've been very interested. But if they hear this, what would be the one thing that you would, what's the one piece of advice you'd give? Open-ended question. Open-ended question. I am a firm believer on investing in, in people uh, and training them so that they can leave, but creating an environment that they won't want to because they're, you know, thriving and fulfilled and and growing and inspired. I I just where hospitality is is in is a people we're a people business and yeah. you have to. I know sometimes you don't necessarily want to invest uh because of financial constraints or but it, it's worth it. It, it it's worth it um if your team is happy and thriving then your guests will feel it and and the bottom line will feel it and and you know that that's that's my bit of advice and then also on the same breath diversity equity and inclusion is not just the right thing to do it's the smart thing to do so that's my tidbit 
I enjoy that. And I mean, we could have actually we probably could have probed that entire, we could come <laughs> back and do this again. I could, we could probably organize a panel. I could get some peers of you to even discuss that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a whole topic that I am very fascinated about, like getting experts in talking about it, because I think, you know, we need to fill up positive ox oxygen about that topic. Cause I think like in the news, it's a bit kind of annoying. And I think like to your point that has tons and tons of value and it's just, the normal right thing to do as opposed to like a program to whatever, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So actually I'll follow up with you on that separately.